Thank you, everybody, for coming in. We are just finishing up our logistics here, ensuring all of our friends are ready to go, and our tech is spectacular. Thank you, all of you, for joining um, this morning or evening or from wherever you are watching. We're just about to start our programming. Thank you, Ellie. You can go ahead and take a, uh, take it over now. All right. Uh, thank you, Eddie, and thank you so much to everyone for being here for our panel on ethical consumption. Uh, I just want to start off by first, uh, you know, mentioning Israel. Our hearts are with the hostages who have now been held away from their families for over half a year. And uh, we hope that uh, the learning that we do today uh, will be a merit uh, in their honor. And we're all praying for their, their speedy return. Uh, to start uh, our panel, I just want to share a quick story, uh, which is when I was in undergrad in YU, I had a rabbi who would rail against um, people going to uh, hotels for for Pesach, and he was railing to a, a group that probably 75% of them were going to hotels for Pesach, um, but he, he would say, he would yell, Dvarim shala yadu abosenu, which means things our, our ancestors didn't know about. Uh, which I'm not sure is completely true, but I think the idea that he was trying to get at uh, was, uh, was a question, right? In our modern world of convenience, how does the Torah expect us to act and think? So to help answer that question, uh, we've invited three panelists uh, here today to share their wisdom. Our first panelist is Rabbi Dina Brower, who serves as the executive director of World Jewish Relief USA, which supports the global humanitarian agency, World Jewish Relief. Prior to relocating to the USA, she spent two decades serving the London Jewish community, teaching uh, Jewish text, curating meaningful and accessible Jewish experiences, and founding a Jewish feminist movement, which became a catalyst for both grassroots and institutional change. Uh, World Jewish Relief is an international humanitarian agency founded in 1933 and is proud to have rescued over 65,000 Jews fleeing Nazis. Today, World Jewish Relief supports vulnerable people from marginalized communities. They are currently working in 18 countries and their impact is both global and local, delivering relief in the aftermath of disaster, supporting farmers and farmers in climate resilience, supporting refugees and addressing poverty by empowering economic independence for women and girls in particular. Uh, Rabbi Dina Brower was born to Moroccan parents serving as Chabad Shlichim in Milan, and uh, she studied in Jerusalem, New York, and London, has a BA in Hebrew and Jewish Studies from the University of London, an MA in, edu uh, in Education and Psychology from the Institute of Education London, and Smicha from Yeshivat Maharat. We also have today with us Dr. Stephen Laufer, an economist and currently at the Myers JDC Brookdale Institute. Previously, he held the position of principal economist at the US Federal Reserve Board, where he advised the board on topics related to housing and mortgage markets. He completed his PhD in economics at New York University and has published numerous articles in leading academic journals, even currently serves as the treasurer of the Aviv Foundation, a private family philanthropy that operates both in the United States and Israel. He is also the board chair of Yeshivat Hovei Torah, the former Pre uh, board president of the Milton Gottesman Jewish Day School in Washington, D.C., and a board member at the Shalom Hartman Institute. Stephen made Aliyah from Washington in 2019 and lives with his wife and three children in Jerusalem. Finally, last but not least, we have with us Rabbi Shmuel Yanklowitz, who is the founder and president of Uri Litzedek, the first and only Orthodox social justice movement. Uh, he is the author of 25 books on Jewish ethics. So let's get started. Um, I want to start with a question, and this will be for, for everyone. Uh, humans have needs that have to be met in order for them to survive. Uh, however, it seems as though some things have shifted in how people consider their consumption practices, if they consider them at all. Can you talk about any trends you see in the modern consumer psyche and what is contributing to the worldview of American consumption? and um, maybe let's start with uh, Rabbi Dina. Can you can you speak to this? Sure. Thank you very much. And it's uh, great to be speaking about consumption, especially as we hit sort of 
I think, peaks um, shopping season pre-Pesach. So there's much that can be said about that. And a lot of it will come across as very berating. So I thought I would kind of talk about two key words, I think, to kind of think about. One is the availability of um, convenience and the affordability of convenience products um, throughout our sort of environment, which makes it very tempting and easy to consume more, coupled with the invisibility of the effect our consuming has. I just want to share a little bit of a story. When I was a little girl, I spent a lot of summers with my grandmother in Israel, and I loved getting up super early in the morning and accompanying her on her trips to the Makolet, the little tiny grocery store. Um, she always set out well before 7 a.m. when the air was still kind of relatively um, warm, cool, not too hot. Um, she had this little plastic shopping basket that she would take along. And then she would buy that day's breakfast, ingredients for dinner, and really not more that she could carry with her up a very steep hill where her apartment was. Another thing I remember was her rinsing out those very thin see-through plastic bags in which sometimes fresh vegetables that she purchased at the market were sort of packaged or stored. And she would hang them on the clothing line to dry. And I do remember my mother sort of berating her for doing all these extra work and trying to explain to her that this was really sort of disposable. She didn't need to rinse and reuse. Um, Another sort of snapshot is remembering my grandmother visiting us in Italy when we had a family simcha and she was then caught by my mother sort of taking all the disposable paper plates and washing them in a the kitchen. And we all laughed and we probably still smiling. We might have similar stories in our family. But the truth is, I think we have gone full circle. We have totally embraced the convenience of disposable goods fast fashion, bulk food buying, all because it's so available, so appealing, so convenient. And slowly we're now sort of kind of come back to becoming more attuned to the global effect of our disposable habits. And while I laughed at my grandmother washing disposable paper plates, she at least was considering reusing them. Now I'm washing every piece of plastic garbage so that hopefully it can be recycled. So I think that the link between everyday consumerism and the global challenges and changes in climate patterns is not always viewed as a direct, clear link. Um, we don't think, think of it as a cause and effect relationship, but that's not to say that the impact is not real, it's not happening now, and it doesn't require us to really give it urgent and immediate attention both as individuals and also as um, systemic level. Thank you, Rabbi Dina. Yeah, I'm hearing the, the uh, yeah the need for an urgent response to the fact that we've so deeply embraced our disposable habits. Uh, Rav Shmuley, do you want to uh, weigh in on this? I'm happy for Dr. Lawford to go next. Sure. Thank you, Shmuley. Thank you, thank you, Ali, for for having me. Great to be here. Um, so I'm I'm here to bring the economist perspective. I'm going to say from an economist perspective, consumption is a is a good thing. Uh, historically, we have measured the growth of society and the development of of developing countries by increases in income, which pretty much translates one into one one to one into growth in consumption. Um, and the the richer countries are, the happier they are in general, up to a point. So there's a point at about seventy five thousand dollars a year where Further increases in income don't make people happier. Um, and it turns out that $75,000 is just about the median income uh, in America today. So it shouldn't maybe surprise us that we've gotten to the point where we're talking about things other than uh, increasing increase, increasing our consumption further and further. Now we're talking about uh, I think two trends in, in this, maybe the shift towards more ethical consumption. Um, one on the demand side, one on the supply side, since I'm an economist. So on the demand side, I think there's been a lot more talk about climate change uh, and the, the impact that our, our consumption is having on the environment. And then I think there's also uh, been a, an increasing trend towards talking about uh, the impact that we as, as people living in developed countries are having on, on uh, developing countries um, and on people living, living in those countries. 
So, and on the supply side, suppliers have kind of latched on to these trends and, and are giving consumers what they want. So there, we've seen the emergence of, of fair trade networks where farmers are getting minimum prices and farmers are organized into cooperatives and getting access to credit. And these programs do in fact um, help our well-being. Uh, we've seen a rise in local small businesses offering ethically sourced products. Uh, and, and at a corporate level, we see more than now more than 70% of companies uh, issue annual reports which describes their, their corporate social responsibility. Um, I'll just say that at a, at a final level, final word, in, in recent years, inflation has been high, um, prices have gone up a lot, and consuming in an ethically way, in an ethical way, is expensive. You're paying extra money for organic produce for um, for locally sourced produce. Uh, so it's been harder. And as people have been facing rising prices and cutting back, um, people have been, I think, cutting back on on ethically sourced, on ethical consumption, and this is hard to afford, and, and that makes perfect sense. Very nice, uh, very nice. Happy to jump in. Uh, first of all, thanks, Rebelli, for organizing, um, and uh, and Eddie for being a co-facilitator. And it's great to learn with Rabbi Dina and Dr. Laufer um, today. And um, my apologies, if my internet get, gets spotty, I'm just gonna turn my video off and speak without the video to get a better connection. I think I first woke up to these issues when I was volunteering for a summer in Ghana, in a village in Ghana. And we had this garbage hole that we would dump all of our leftover food and other garbage in this hole every night. And I, I woke up early to jog one morning and I noticed that all the neighborhood kids were digging up that hole because all of our garbage was gold to them. Um, and I continued to find that um, each morning that that was the case. And just a very different real uh, reality when dealing with the global south and what we have access to. Um, but I want to say before I get a little more fiery that I do believe Judaism is about balance. Um, I don't, I want to reject kind of a hedonistic extreme and also a, a total ascetic extreme and say that there does have to be some balance between human needs and Jewish responsibility. And I don't know what that looks like, but I do think we're too far on the hedonistic side right now, the American Jewish community at large. I can't speak to the Israeli context as much, but I certainly think it's less there. Um, um, in any case, I want to point to four trends that I'm observing briefly. The first has to do with dispensability in general, dispensability in relationships. Of course, divorce is not always bad. Divorce can be very healthy and right. But the fact that over half of marriages end in divorce, um, the, the note, um, that people leave jobs more quickly and easily, um, the, the amount of products that are disposable. I think there's a culture of dispensability that we just think of things as not lasting. Uh, we, th we love change. We love uh, new experiences in a way that I think is radical given human history. That's the first. The second, I think, is that we live in a hyper-politicized time. Hyper-politicized, and I think what, what, why that's relevant here is why does somebody view themselves as virtuous? Because of how they vote, right? I am virtuous because I'm a Democrat. I'm virtuous because I'm a Republican. I'm virtuous because I made 10 posts about where I stand politically, right? And I think that that's really shallow and sad. Um, we make ethical consumption decisions dozens of times a day in our consumption. And in fact, the Torah teaches us that the birth of morality comes from the first act of consumption. The first humans eat from Eitz Hadat Tovera. They eat from the knowledge, uh, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the birth of their morality is, um, emerges in their consciousness in the first time they consume something, which is to say, I think the better moral compass than how we vote, as important as voting is, is what, how we spend our money each day. Um, and um, so, that, so that's the second, is I think this hyper-politicization of identity is dragging down this other identity around consumer identity. On the flip side, I think consumer identity is too high. I think that Americans largely have two primary identities, as citizen, who we vote for, and as consumer, the stuff we wear, the stuff we eat, the stuff we're constantly um, you know, filling our lives with. And who, who loses out when consumer and citizen are primary is society. Are we members of society, society beyond government and, and business? Are we a part of communities? Are we a part of the arts? Are we a part of the nonprofit world? And so I think that this consumer identity along citizen identity is too high. 
The fourth uh, thing I'll say uh, in terms of trend, and um, here I'm going to sound um, sound really from when I talk about you know Gashmius, but I think there is a pleasure obsep- uh, obsession in our day. I, I really think that the growth uh, the growth of hedonism and the sense that life really is about feeling good, measured in utilitarian or consequentialist sense, that um, I'm very particular about the food I want. I'm very particular about the clothes I want. I'm very particular about what uh, the exercise I want. I I have all these different needs that that historically humans didn't have. And of course, that's good. It's good that we have access to particular, you know, this type of particularity. On the other hand, um, I think that that has entered the Jewish community. Rav Aaron Lichtenstein famously called it from hedonism, that anything that's got a hat sure is justified. Um, and so I think that's part of the reality we're in. I want to say that like, I am a little bit in a state of despair on the, these issues. I think it's really hard. One of the issues I'm very involved with right now is the Uyghur genocide, working with the, um, the Elie Wiesel Foundation for Humanity on uh, partnering with them on this Uyghur genocide and Uyghur groups. And it's, it's, it, it's close to impossible on both the business and government side. On the business side, the CEO simply don't want to pull out of China. And if they speak about the Uyghur genocide issue, that they're pushed out of China. That's the first. And almost everything we're buying is um, is connected to companies with forced labor in in the in the Uyghur region. And then on the on the government side, even though the Senate and Congress passed uh, import bans on on Uyghur forced labor products, um, there's easy workarounds. Countless, not countless, maybe four or five easy easy workarounds. And so I feel a lot of despair on that and other issues on how difficult it is to change um, consumer habits, in, you know, on, on ethical, ethical fronts and how much mis, uh, how many misperceptions there are, labels that are not accurate labels. I mean, labels on everything that, you know, cage free and fair trade. And, um, you know, I mean, those of us immersed in hashkathas know how complicated hashkathas are. And then you enter all these other ethical uh, certifications, and a lot of them are misleading. And yet Rabbi Nachman says, Ein ye ulam there's no despair. And so I think um, there are... Thank you, uh, Rav Shmuley, for the, uh, <clears throat> for the clear view of sort of what the dynamic is here, what the Torah what the Torah ethic might be, and also, yeah, and a recognition of the difficulty of reacting here. Uh, Dr. Laufer, I want to come back to uh, a point that you made, which uh, you were talking about. There's there's sort of tipping points in our in our economy, and we've hit uh, a point where we're actually starting to consider uh, we're we're starting to consider some of the costs of uh, consumption, which you noted generally is a good thing. But I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the relationship between, uh, you know, the maybe consumption is generally seen seen in economy as a good thing, but uh, yeah, how that eventually becomes something which has which has costs that we need to consider. Um, sure. So, so, so normally, as I said, okay, coming back to this, we think of consumption as as a good thing. Uh, and and we think of you you get you get goods and services and you pay and you pay a price and I think what we're talking about uh, today this afternoon this evening depending on, on on where you are is is consuming things that are not really things that are not goods and services that are other kinds of uh, other kinds of, of products so things um, and and the kind of started that what does it mean to to think to to consume other kinds of products like giving money giving money to charity spending extra money on on ethically raised meat, and we 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 tend to think of a so we have a we have a framework for thinking of that. So um, we think of one thing we think of is a, a warm glow. So it, it just makes us feel good to to spend money in, the, in these other ways. Uh, another reason we we might consume these other kinds of other kinds of things is for social reasons. So we used to talk about conspicuous consumption. We loved going out and driving a big car down the street to show that we we made it, that we had we had an income that we could afford these things. And now in this kind of, I think this, the shift, we go towards this towards more, more ethical consumption, we might talk about a conspicuous conservation where we're driving uh, cars, which are specifically designed to be better for the environment. So one, one, one piece of evidence here is that the Toyota Prius is a, is a hybrid vehicle and it's, it's traditionally sells at a higher price and, and more successfully than something like a, a Honda Accord, which is also available 
in a in a as a as a hybrid, but it's not as identifiable as such because there's also a non-hybrid model. But the fact that people like to drive these uh, uh, something which is more obviously identifiable uh, as a hybrid is it's a social signal about about your values um, and and maybe encourages other people. Uh, and the, the the final reason is is we might is that what what looks like consuming a non a non good might actually be uh, associated with quality. So I I live in Israel. Uh, and uh, Israel, from, from an economic perspective, is basically an island um, where where all the produce is local, which is great from an ethical point of view. And I will tell you, it tastes better too. Um, so so sometimes sometimes uh, you know an ethical consumption can also be also be uh, a, a stand-in for for quality. But when we think about like, all kinds of consumption, whether it's traditional consumption, whether it's ethical consumption, it has costs. It has it takes real time and real effort. To do research to determine um, what what we want to do, how we want to spend our time and our money, and we have to optimize uh, and given and take into account all the costs and all the benefits, and then uh, with our own preferences and our own our own values and the constraints, we want to try to try to live the life and be be the consumers we want to be and consume the goods that we that we want and that we feel good about consuming. Yeah, thank you. So. Uh, Dina, maybe you can uh, talk to us in your work where you've seen the effects of uh, people not totally integrating their ethics into their consumerism, uh, and yeah, some of the some of the effects of that. Thank you, thank you for that. So I, I'd like to start by sharing my screen and um, showing you an image. This is um, a photograph taken just outside along the banks of the Bagnati River in um, Nepal, where a lot of the garbage that is produced outside of that country ends up. Um, I think the image speaks for itself. And I guess there are two main examples I want to focus on. And one has to do with the sort of inequality of disposal and use. Um, the effects of unrestrained consumerism are really visible in several of the countries where World Jewish Relief implements humanitarian response and climate resilience programs. It, in Kathmandu, Nepal, as you could see, these piles of garbage are seen not just alongside the river, but also sometimes alongside streets. Um, it's the river water is used by local people for drinking, cooking, bathing, and so you can imagine the effect to that. And basically, one of the um, outcomes of the uh, unrestrained consumerism is that lack of responsibility that is not just, you know, taken by consumers, but also producers for disposing of these sort of leftovers of our, our consumerism, of our products, whether it's fuel, plastics, construction waste. Uh, many countries actually have um, weaker regulations about um, garbage and uh, waste disposal and waste management. And so developed countries um, like ours really takes advantage and corporations take advantage and explode this. So we in the US, Canada, even Europe have already offloaded hundreds of millions of tons of plastics into other countries where much of it ends up in landfill, is burned or littered into the environment. So these images I think are really um, impossible to ignore. So that's um, one example. My second example is from temperature. I would um, just kind of think about, about it as air conditioner poverty, um, air con poverty as heat and temperature rises. Um, interestingly, today in the news, I don't know if you saw the headline, Swiss women won a landmark case suing their government for failing to meet emission goals. And they say that because of their age and gender, they're particularly vulnerable to the effects of heat waves linked to climate change. We've all experienced kind of changes in heat, in, in, in temperature. You know, we might rack up the, the temperature on our air conditioning. But in countries such as the Philippines, the effect of unrestrained consumerism is felt really physically. My colleagues um, from our international programs traveled recently to visit uh, the program that we support there, um, working with indigenous communities to build early warning systems for typhoons. Um, local people live in 
a housing made out of bamboo. They work as farmers and fishermen. Um, and they're incredibly exposed to the intensifying heat. And they really felt a stark contrast as they left the sort of program uh, partners in the village and then returned to the capital in an air conditioned car, you know, walked into air conditioner hotel um, offices and so on. That is a kind of luxury air conditioning again, kind of managing temperature is a luxury that you know, the average person living with the effect in a vulnerable community does not have. And so this temperature inequality is something that many middle income countries have to deal with. The wealthier classes are able to shield themselves from the intensifying heat using air conditioning, more electricity that actually feeds back into this loop of kind of still um, creating more of the, or intensifying the climate crisis. And the poorer classes suffer through and working manual um, labor jobs, you know, risking heat stroke, dehydration, exhaustion, and so on. So that's the second example. And those two, I think, are sort of very stark images to kind of think about as we go through our, you know, time considering this, our usage. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Radina. Um, so after seeing that picture, right, of all, all this, uh, all that, um, all those, that plastic washed up along the shore somewhere else that I never see, right? Except for the fact that you brought that picture to me. Um, it's frustrating, kind of like uh, what Rav Shmuley said, right? It, there, there's, I'm feeling a real frustration. And I'm sort of, I'm, I'm wondering, that seems really bad. And in a, I would expect that um, our economy would not be allowing that basically to happen. Uh, and I guess my question for Dr. Laufer is, what's going on here with, uh, right? Why, why is it possible for, um, for people to even like make the decision to buy something in plastic and have it end up further, uh, you know, further down the world somewhere where it can't, can't be dealt with? It seems to me like, like an economic issue. You know, I've heard the term externalities. Uh, you know, this is something that someone else is going to pay for some other time. I'm wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Uh, it, yes. So it is an externality. We, we might call it a market failure. So in, in some places, economic markets work pretty, pretty well. So if I have to make a decision about um, going out and buying a new phone and the cost of buying that phone is I'm not going to be able to go out to eat as much. So that's all decision making and I'm bearing all the cost of that within myself so I can make good decisions. Um, so as you say, and as, as Rabbi Dina showed pretty powerfully, one place where, pe where markets break down is where we're making choices and the costs of those choices are being felt elsewhere. Um, and so our use, use of disposable goods that end up in landfills or our, our, you know, burning fossil fuels in our cars and, and causing pollution, these are, these are ex externalities, as you, as you call them, as, as they're called. Um, the costs that I don't bear when I make consumption decisions that someone else ends up um, bearing. And because I don't bear the, the cost, because the price doesn't fall on me, I don't really care in most cases. Um, and so what this means is that unless, unless policy comes in and, and does something about it, I'm essentially paying a lower cost than the actual cost of these things. And the first law of demand is that when cost is lower, people consume more of it. So, so when these costs aren't factored in, people consume more and they consume too much. So we have too much consumption of plastics that are being deposited in landfills. We have too much consumption of, of carbon-based of uh, carbon fuels that are polluting the environment um, because the, they're, not, they're not priced in. The solution is to price them in. Uh, if, if there were a, a carbon tax where you're know, burning, burning fossil fuels, uh, impose an extra tax, if there were extra extra costs associated with things that created more landfill, that would raise the price uh, and cause us to consume less. In the absence of, of legislation and policy, some people buy uh, carbon offsets, right? So anytime they, they do something which is going to increase their carbon footprint, they go out and they pay for that. They buy essentially buy that consumption of carbon. And what that does is that raises the price to the point where the thing we're consuming is, ac is actively priced and then you shouldn't get an excess of it. 
and you should get actually the right amount. So once that extra cost is factored in, you should be paying the full price and then you should be able to, to enjoy it. But it doesn't mean that you should never use a disposable object. It doesn't mean that you should never you know, take a flight. It just means that you have to recognize that the costs of those are higher than, than, than the current sticker price. And then if, if you have that, you have in, have in mind either because you're buying a carbon offset or because you, you have in mind or there's an actual policy that increases the price of those things, then you're actually paying the full price. And then, uh, you know, as an economist, I would say, if you're willing to pay, pay the full price and you still think it's worth it, then, then you should go ahead, you should go ahead and do it. But you should have in mind, I think the important thing is to have in mind the full cost of, of what you're consuming. Um, and and that'll, that'll lead you to make better decisions and it'll lead society to, to get to a place where the total amount that we're consuming is is the right amount, which 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 um, which weighs both the benefits of consumption and also the actual full costs of what we're consuming. Thank you, Dr. Laufer, for turning our attention to the full cost. And you know, as uh, Rabbi Dina showed us, the full cost is really uh, destructive in some other parts of the world that we don't always see. Rav Shmuley, how how do we start thinking about this? What's the Torah ethic on? Right? Do we have a responsibility to think about the downstream impacts of what we consume? Okay, well, that's a great question. And I think it's not just a moral question, um, but a religious question, I I assuming we separate those two. Um, so let me share my screen for a moment. I'm going to share this source that I've thought about for probably 15 years now, say for a chinuch. And uh, can everyone see that? Give me a thumbs up if you can see that. All right, great. So um, I'm just going to read a part of it. So as many people know, avodazara, idolatry, is one of the worst things uh, that Jews can participate in. In fact, we should break we should break any mitzvah for the saving life, except for three, as many know. If somebody says, Shmuley, uh, eat this pork or I will kill you, my answer is, please pass the barbecue sauce, right? But if somebody says, um, will you commit, you know, an act of idolatry or or adultery, um, or kill this other person, I have to say, no, we, we should die before engaging in idolatry. But what is idolatry in the modern age? Idolatry, okay, so there's debates, is Hinduism idolatry? And, you know, and you know, what are the religions today that we might still consider avodazara? But I think that most are engaged in a broader moral conversation about what avodazara is. So here in the Sefer Chinuch, we see the idea that we cannot gain any pleasure at all from something, you know, um, connected to Avodazara. So quickly here in the Hebrew, in the bold, um, if you go to the fifth line down, I bolded it so it's easy to see. That it says that... Um, you should not a person should not attach their money um, to anything that was produced with stealing or violence or anything really disgusting. All of this is considered um, products attached to idolatry. Like what? What are you talking about? If it's produced with violence or theft, like that's a moral issue. That's not avodazara. So here he explains. This is a pretty radical move he makes here. He says that um, basically when I listen to my Yetzirah, I listen to this instinct in me that merely wants pleasure, merely wants to feel good, merely wants to gain what I want to gain at any expense, right? I essentially make my own Yetzir absolute instead of God absolute. If I make God absolute, I live by certain values that 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 outweigh my own instincts, right? But when I say my Yitzhahara, my instinct, I'm hungry, I'm desirous, I'm covetous, whatever this is I want matters the most, and I consume something produced unethically, that that is connected to Abu Dazara. Now, that's pretty intense, so let me walk that back a little bit, because I don't think we could live on that level. As I said, just thinking about just how interconnected the marketplace is, and thinking how the, the numbers of injustices that are involved in the production process. Um, but I think thinking about the extremes is helpful, even if we can't go that far. And here, too, another extreme example would be someone like a Peter Singer, 
right? Who I don't think represents a Torah ethic, but I think challenges us to think that he says, okay, so if somebody's at my feet about to die and I could save their life for $3, I've committed murder by buying coffee in, for $3 instead of saving the child at my feet. Okay, that's easy. But he says today, that child doesn't have to be at our feet. We know they're alive. We know they need that $3. And if I choose that luxury, it's like an act of murder. And so again, that might, that, that's very intense, um, but it, it can be productively uncomfortable or um, uh, you know, for us to, to think about um, where we need to curb certain luxuries if we truly care about the future. Now, when I say the future, that is to say, is our only concern living people who are suffering or is our concern the future? And I want to point us to someone named William McCaskill, who actually Isaac Blumenthal, my colleague who's on this Zoom, initially introduced me to. William McCaskill is a young Scottish uh, philosopher connected to the effective altruism movement, whether we like that movement or not, bracket that. And he talks about long-termism. And I'm here, I'm going to share my screen. In long-termism, uh, let's see, how can I get to my... Uh, my uh let's see if this works can i uh no that's the wrong share sorry how do i share my internet page let's see if that's the right one no that's not it all right well i guess i can't i can't it's not letting me share my uh okay so essentially in in long termism we we see the ethical question of who should matter more smaller number of people alive today or a much larger number of people to exist in the future um, given uh, human population growth, the number of people to exist in the future are much greater than the number of people who exist now. And so should we invest more in living people? Because how could I be concerned for the abstract unliving people? Like that doesn't feel like a fair ethical concern. On the other hand, uh, as a utilitarian, he would say, right, we care about the masses more than the few, and many more people are going to exist in the future, so we should philanthropically invest much more into the greater number of people, which are the future people rather than the current people. And so I think that on the Torah side, um, we generally, as opposed to looking at deontology and utilitarianism, look at virtue ethics. What is my character? What is my responsibility? as as me um and and i think that is productive to take a musar approach here to say what um what does it mean to be a mensch in how i consume and that's and that's a hard personal question we can all grapple with but if we introduce the utilitarian question around biggest impact i think that's another framework worth exploring yeah, thank you originally for the call to uh, examine this from sort of a muster standpoint and from a virtue ethics standpoint. And uh, yeah, the the call and to think about this as avodah zara, I find uh, particularly powerful. So let's say I'm bought in, right? Um, to thinking about this Jewishly, right? Uh, what are one or two areas that you think we as Jews maybe should start considering? Uh, what are what are a couple areas where we might want to start making some lifestyle changes? Is that, is that for me? Yeah, for you. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. So um, I want to start by saying we should be gentle with ourselves. Those of us who really care about this, it can be really difficult to sit with these realities. If we've truly learned about it, we've watched documentaries, um, we've seen images like Rabbi Dina shared. Um, I think this is very heavy. It's very heavy to think about the reality and to put that weight on us. I know I feel it very heavily and I, and other people in my family and close circles feel it very heavily. To be gentle with ourselves, we cannot do this perfectly. And I think that what we can do is pick a few areas where we're uniquely passionate and try to make a difference in those areas rather than trying to do it all. And make sure that our guilt is never too low and never too high. We should have a productive level of guilt around this complicated issue that is, uh, is, um, is serving us and the world. So to start with that, I, uh, I, I, oh, so I said passion, but I think there's a second framework, which is power. I think we should say, where is my passion? Where is my power? That's the most sustainable approach in my view. Where do I have a unique sphere of influence is my power? And where am I uniquely passionate that I can sustainably commit to a lifestyle practice? I'll share three for me. And I'm, the three I'm sharing are not me promoting those as the most central. Did I, did I freeze? Am I back? Yeah, okay. you were about to tell us the three. Okay. The, the first for me is the Uri Tzedek Tav HaYosher program. 
The Tava Yoshia program makes sure that workers who work in kosher establishments are treated at the very least according to law. I want to know that if I buy a kosher sandwich, that the Mexican immigrant um, in the back room, or if in Israel, and you know, an Arab employee or whoever, whoever, whoever is the invisible person who is usually more marginalized, that they are at the very least treated according to law. We can debate living wage and 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 um, minimum wage. At the very least, if there's a law of the land, dina de machuta dina, I want to know that those workers that I am that I am supporting this establishment are treated properly. This is a very hard movement for us to, to further the worker justice movement as it's connects to our our ethical kashrut. So that's the first for me that I, I continue to work on on a weekly basis with our team here. The second is my own commitment to a vegan practice. I'm very concer concerned about um, factory farming and the horrific treatment um, uh, in the meat industry, in the dairy industry, in the egg industry, and just how normalized it's become in the modern Orthodox community, for example, to, um, to not even think about those questions and kind of swipe them away uh, very, very easily um, as, as, as the needs of humans, surah adam, that our needs basically trump any, any you know, animal suffering concerns. And the third for me, um, although there's so many others, has to do with um, foster children. Child welfare is uh, one of my top, you know, three concerns in the world. The number of vulnerable children in the world who are orphans, who are foster children, who um, are victims of abuse, and, um, and who don't have the basic supplies they need and often experience neglect. Um, and so to think about um, a, a whole different system of distribution around supplies that that vulnerable children need, in addition to the care in the homes they need. So again, those are those are three of of the of uh, if I had a top ten, those are probably my top three immigrant workers that are supporting the kosher industry, um, the treatment of of of, of animals, and um, and vulnerable children in the world, making sure that they have th their basic needs met, and the the framework I would invite people to think about in terms of what they're going to embrace is our passion and our power. Um, the, the, and, I, and I want to just end by throwing a question to Dr. Laffer, and you can decide, Rebelli, if this is the right time for him to address it or not, is um, there's, so, there's so much, you know, those of us who are not economists are always confused about this issue of higher wages. Um, I know that I, I don't think the data is out yet on California and, and the recent increase of wages is to $20 and how much that's going to lead to higher unemployment. But in, in the conservative world, it's largely taken for granted that raising wages means, um, you know, more people laid off. And I think industry by industry, I've learned that's a little more complicated. But some of the pushback I've consistently received around worker justice issues is you're hurting workers more by demanding fair wages because the less workers are going to have jobs. And I wonder if you can, you know, kind of, you know, share a little insight on that as well, if, if that's the right time at least, uh, for ability for him to way in on that. Uh, whether or not it's the right time, I'll leave up to Dr. Laufer. If you'd like to respond uh, to the pop question, you may, and otherwise I have uh, some other questions. All right, sure. So as you say, it's complicated and the, the evidence is, is, a little, is a little mixed. We used to think the classic, the classic way of thinking is uh, you propose higher wages that raises unemployment. Um, the evidence isn't as clear as, as we once thought it was, so it's, it, it's complicated. Um, I would say most economists probably think um, Higher, weight, higher amounts of money in the pockets of, of poor workers is important and better to do it through you know, something like the earned income tax credit than imposing in higher higher wages. So the, we definitely agree with the goal. I'm not sure that a, a higher minimum wage is, is the most efficient way to do it. Okay, and- uh, maybe, interesting, thank you. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Dr. Lefer, and thank you, Riv Shmuley, for uh, giving us sort of a context for how you're thinking about uh, some lifestyle changes that that, uh, that we could make. Uh, Rabbi Dina, what do you think our responsibility is here from what you've seen? What can we start doing right now, and uh, what can we what can we be thinking about? Thank you, Rabbi. Um, so just like Rabbi Shmuley said, um, passion and power you need a balance you have to kind of do what's kind of you can, you're capable to do and as we've kind of all sort of said like yeah the, the picture is quite depressing it can be very daunting like literally how do you tackle such a monumental pile of garbage so going back to the fact of the time we're in you know we're approaching Pesach, Passover 
probably the moment of peak consumerism in the Jewish calendar, I think, where we all jo joke how much food and how much shopping is necessary for one week of celebrations. Um, and I know that's personally my general standards for reducing waste and recycling are much harder to maintain during the festive season. Um, I can see it literally physically in the amount of trash that we take out in the one week. But I also think that Pesach offers us a model for tackling this challenge. It requires us to both burn the chametz and eat matzah. Like many Jewish practices, right? We have both the element of abstinence from something, avoiding something, like the withholding of something, and then an element of action, something positive that we have to do. And I think um, while it's imperative to restrain our consumption and reduce our ref refuse, um, it's so much, you know, that's part of what we call climate mitigation. Um, but that's sort of like abstaining from trying to reduce consumption. But we should also try to embrace the positive, the climate adaptation, something that is, I think, often less talked about. Um, it's an approach to supporting people who are already living with the effect of climate changes in adapting their livelihoods and to be better prepared for the inevitable damage of climate events. Vulnerable communities around the world are impacted by the everyday decisions we make, from what we eat to how we travel. And, you know, we can hide behind the invisibility of the impact from these decisions, but really that's not fair, even if we think about the full cost, as Stephen was saying earlier, um, some of us may be able to afford the cost. Um, the question is, what is the financial cost? What's the discomfort cost, right? Is there a price that we can pay in a little bit of discomfort to uphold values and ethics? So for example, you know, you, we don't even have to bat an eyelid at the price of disposable plastic paper goods. And we like to host lots of big meals and be very charitable and hospitable. <laughs> But that's at the expense of, you know, you know, often using a lot of disposable goods. Can we sort of try to focus a little bit more on that little bit of discomfort, that kind of loading of the dishwasher or washing of dishes, perhaps as a, a very simple example? Um, for me, the turning point was really hearing a personal story from a Nepalese farmer, a father of seven called Vishnu who described how eight days of consecutive and unseasonal rains washed away all of his hard work. And then he ended up, after months of working the land, just barely enough to feed his family one meal a day. World Jewish Relief has climate resilience programs, and through one of the programs in Nepal, where Vishnu lives with his family, together with another 2,592 people in six communities in Sindhupalchok and Mahotari, um, they now have been able to adapt their practices and plant a range of flood and drought resistant crops because they cannot foretell what the weather is going to be like. But they're now resilient enough to always have something that they can bring to market or eat with their families. So I think that learning individual stories and the impact of climate events on individual communities and people um, really sort of helps us understand and kind of appreciate this unseasonable um, temperature rises and make a difference to, you know, think about how what we do makes a difference to people um, and impacts them and also ignites our motivation to consume less and try to kind of be more mindful of what we can do on our end. So again, to what I said at the beginning, so there's a convenience um, the availability, the inexpense, the affordability of some um, luxuries, so to say, for us, but also the invisibility of like the effect. And so if we bring the effect into our field of vision and make it more visible, hopefully that's sort of like that balance between the kind of reduction of consumerism, the kind of berating ourselves for the things we throw away or for the lifestyle we, li we live, but it's also balanced with like passionately trying to kind of make a difference and supporting those who are living with the impact that is already there and embracing really climate adaptation and resilience um, in a practical way to, to motivate us to perhaps also consume less, but also make a positive impact. Beautiful. Um, in, inspired by Rabbi Brower's comments there. And, uh, and, it, it, you know, and, and since you brought up Pesach, I want to just bring up one Pesach about it. Then I have a question for Dr. Laffer. Um, there's a story usually told about Rabbi Yisrael Salanter. I've heard it attributed to another rabbi at other times, but it's a pretty well-known story, but I think it fits in well in this moment where he's asked to give 
he's asked to give, um, you know, Hashkacha to the matzah factory in, in his town. And, um, and uh, he goes to inspect it. And after a few hours inspecting, he, uh, the owner says, so new, can we get the Hashkacha? And he says, and he says absolutely not. I, I won't, I, you know, this is not kosher matzah. And the owner says, well, what's the problem? You found chametz, so but baked too long. You found water in the wrong places. Like, what's going on? And um, he said, do you see those women back there who've been working here for hours? There's practically blood on their fingertips. They haven't had a break. And I think that that's a great conscience to go into Pesach with. Um, if we come out of Pesach just with good songs and good food, have we really done Pesach? I mean, this is this is a liberation movement um, for us to see beyond the surface in what we're consuming. And that. Um, so anyways, more to say about that. But my question for Dr. Lawfer is, part of what I'm thinking about today in this conversation is a Torah Jew, um, without us prescribing what they should do on this, because it's complicated, there's many issues. I think what my takeaway is we should be more intentional. We should be more aware of what's happening, more conscientious of our decisions, and more intentional. And I'm thinking since Daniel Kahneman passed away just about a week ago, one of his most popular kind of insights, whether it's been you know disproven or not, I don't know, um, is around loss aversion. You know, and just thinking about how the uh, the loss of a hundred dollars uh, hurts double as much as the gain of a hundred dollars uh, feels good. And but I wonder, um, as uh, irrational attachments like that, for those of us who want to be more intentional, what are some of the irrational attachments we have in our kind of consumption habits that we might kind of take out of the shadows and bring more into our consciousness? Um, so that it's not marketers who kind of control what people buy based on good marketing, but more intentional consumers. So that makes sense. Uh, yeah. So I think one of the one of the uh, one of the conclusions of the behavioral economics movement is that people aren't rational. That that loss aversion. It's not that we're irrational by having. We are irrational, but it's not that it's we're doing something wrong by having loss aversion. That's just it describes how we behave and to lose something just it feels worse than to gain something more and it's not that we have to combat that because it's irrational that's just a description of, of of human of human preferences and we have to take that as, as given but certainly i mean doing things uh uh bringing intentionality to to our to our eating to our uh to our uh, our consumption to everything we do is is i think for many people is that, that's the secret to happiness is to is to is to do things with intention and not just because they're being being thrown at us uh, from the outside, but really to make to make choices at every moment. What do we want to be doing? What choices do we want to be making? Uh, yeah, I want to also I I, I want to answer this question a little bit also, which is sort of just to <laughs> if I can as a moderator, uh, just jump jump in on this. Um, I think that like uh, our Judaism gives us a, lo a lot of chance for intentionality. Uh, we have to make brachot on every single thing we can consu consume, literally eat. Uh, it's, it's delayed gratification. It's a moment to ponder. It's a chance to ponder. And uh, where, where did this come from? And where is it going? And where am I going? And it's a real chance. It's a real chance to slow down. Um, I also recently have been finding a lot of uh, a lot of benefit from the practice of fasting. We have five fasts built into our our Jewish year, and it's I find the opposite of American consumerism, um, where we want to have anything we want exactly the way we want it, whenever we want it, and taking a whole day off from our uh, conspicuous consumption uh, can can be used as a way to set an intentionality around our consumption. Uh, so that's that's just a practice that I've been trying, and I'd uh, like to pass this to Rabbi Dina. You know, um, what's uh, you know, it's it's hard to change our habits, uh, but you've seen some really uh, difficult results of people who haven't been really changing their habits. What's a way that we could support ourselves in making changes to our to our lifestyle? Yeah, thank you. It is hard, and um, in the double issue. Uh, double, double holiday issue of The Economist um, this year, they featured a section on climate and there was a British um, engineer who decided to give up flying uh, because um, 
you know, he wanted to cut his emission. He, he didn't just get rid of his cars. He had them totaled so nobody else could use them. And he's just like totally sort of like going to like what we would think of an extreme type of radical sort of like reduction of consumption, which isn't so livable. There's actually a really cool character, probably my favorite character in the Talmud, who, who does something similar. Um, it's a long story for, an, for another time. But I think we have those models and then they're really hard to live up to. So I think I go back to that balance, idea of balance, and actually the messages of Pesach. Um, I do feel that, you know, this sort of balance between burning the chametz, you know, getting rid of the chametz by burning it, but also having to eat matzah is an interesting, again, sort of balance between the two. When we think about the difference between chametz and matzah, it's actually minimal, right? Both are made with flour and water. So that if you let it kind of sit, it rises, it leavens, it puffs up. And so bread has a completely different texture and appearance to matzah. But um, the Hasidic masters tend to think about chametz as a metaphor for everything that is superfluous. Um, and so we have to get rid of it by burning it before we can enter this time of Pesach, this Passover um, experience of freedom. So maybe... Pesach is this invitation for us to all go back to think about a more basic lifestyle, thinking what is it that is really necessary for us? What is it that we can live without? As you were talking before about intentionality, you know, that balance between, yes, enjoying ourselves, but also moments of fast and abstinence. Um, those are like the sort of, you know, that's the rhythm of Jewish life, the feasting and fasting. But, but Pesach itself is kind of this exception because we're feasting, but we're feasting in a very modest way. We're kind of trying to get rid of like the, the fluff in a sense. So can we use those eight days to really think about how we adopt that message into the rest of our you know, year? Um, the, the funny thing is that even though we can't eat leavened goods, when you go to like a kosher supermarket section, there's all ways of kind of trying to imitate chametz and making pasta and bagels and everything else kosher le Pesach, which I think defeats the purpose a little bit. And maybe that is why the rabbis who, you know, saw everything that people made out of kitniot, you know, legume flour that resembled hummets, they were so kind of like upset about it. Maybe it's just not in the spirit. So whether we eat the kosher le Pesach, um, you know, bagels or, or pasta, what we can do is really use these eight days to kind of really consider um, what is it that we can do without, maybe with a little bit of discomfort, but because it's an investment in not only ourselves, but like the global community and, and the this, this invisible people that we don't see who really need redemption from, you know, real suffering um, and the consequences of our consumerism. Wow. And... On that amazing Torah from Rabbi Dina and the uh, call to conscientiousness from all of our panelists, Rabbi Dina, Dr. Laufer, Rabbi Shmuley, uh, I'd like to thank all of you for, uh, for coming today and being in conversation with us about this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for organizing. And just before we hop off, I want to make a pitch for our 15-year celebration, virtual celebration of the Tava Yoshir uh, coming up next month. We're learning with Rabbi Dina Nyman and a bunch of other scholars about um, celebrating this, this movement together. Wonderful to learn with you all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks, Amir. Thanks, Amir. All right, everyone.